All right, so uh, thanks to everyone for checking out uh, the latest uh, Elite call. Um, this one is going to be with our newest uh, Elite Pro, uh, Espen. He is uh, joining us from Thailand at the moment. And so we are on uh, exactly polar opposite uh, time, time zones here. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be joined by him and uh, happy for everybody to get to know Espen a little better. So welcome, welcome aboard Espen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward. So, um, so for, for the Run It Once audience, this is probably um, the first time that a lot of them are going to get to know you. So, so walk us through basically how you got started in poker and how you arrived on the scene, you know, up to, up to this point. Yeah, uh, I guess I started playing in like 2004, 2005. I was 16, um, living in Norway and just playing home games with my friends. Uh, some of the older kids that was like a couple of years older than me had started playing in my hometown. Um, so I started playing a bit with them, started playing free roles online. Um, uh, I was playing a lot of video games back then. I was playing a ton of Warcraft 3, The Frozen Throne. And one of my clan mates in Warcraft 3, he was getting heavily into poker. So he kind of told me, hey, you need to get in this because it's a lot of fun and you can actually make money as well. So I remember he sent me $50 on Poker Stars, I think it was. And, um, and yeah, uh, just went from there, bought all the books, Super System by Doyle Brunson and Theory of Poker by David Sklansky. Uh, mathematics of poker by Bill Chen, I guess, and some of the like old classics. Uh, grinded my way through them. Uh, signed up to coaching sites, and I was like, not super serious about it, but like pretty serious, I would say. Um, serious hobby player. Um, so I was playing fixed limit the first couple of years, I guess, or first year or two. Uh, fixed limit was the biggest game. Then in 2004, 2005, I guess No Limit Hold'em took over pretty quickly when it's, yeah, uh, around there. So I started playing No Limit Hold'em, played Sit and Goes for a while. Um, then transitioned into Heads Up Cash Games, played Heads Up Cash Games exclusively for like six years. Um, but at that time I was going to school, I was doing a lot of other things, including playing a ton of World of Warcraft and partying a lot. So I was just like... Uh, I don't know. I wasn't very ambitious and I wasn't taking it very seriously. Uh, in the beginning I was, but then it uh, veined and I was less and less serious. I was just bum hunting people and not being very professional about it. Um, so then uh, I kind of decided that I was going to get an education, just have a backup plan if poker didn't really work out because at that point I wasn't too serious about it. So I went to university and did a master's degree in, or I did a bachelor first in food science, and then I did a master's in brewing science. Um, so beer brewing, I was a really big beer geek back then, and I wanted to start my own brewery, and I had all these plans for that. Um, I actually ended up moving to Budapest, Hungary, to start my own craft brewery. Um, we had everything set up, like logo, we had uh, recipes, we had a place to brew the beer, we had a web page, we had everything set up. And then like last minute, I kind of uh, skipped it because I was also streaming poker on Twitch at that time. I was playing just mid stakes cash games like NL400 uh, on Unibet. And uh, Unibet offered me a sponsorship since I was streaming on Twitch. So I was like, okay, um, People are not going to stop drinking beer anytime soon. I can do the beer thing whenever. Poker is kind of here and now. If I want to do that, it's probably a good spot to just take it now. Um, so yeah, went full full time into poker again and decided to give it another shot. That was in 2016, I guess, or something. 17. It's like five, six years ago, I think. Um, and yeah, then I was sponsored by Unibet for a few years. Um, playing mostly cash games, uh, traveling the live circuit and playing some tournaments. But then for the last three years or so, maybe I've been playing tournaments full time, three, four years. Yeah. Well, that that generates a, a shit ton of questions for me, I guess. But uh, the, the first one, uh, so how come you decided to go to Budapest to to do the beer thing and not not in Norway? 
the plan was to do it in Norway when I started my education. But then when I was finished with my education, the craft beer scene in Norway had exploded by a lot. And it was like super saturated market. Um, mm. Everyone was starting a craft brewery in Norway and it was like a very big thing. Um, so it was just a lot of competition. Uh, in Budapest, it was still pretty fresh, pretty new. Uh, not a lot of competition. So we figured it would be like easier to break into that market to begin with. Um, also, my girlfriend at the time was Hungarian. So oh, that makes sense. We had some we had some connections in Budapest, and my business partner was also uh, half Hungarian. His mom was from Hungary, and his uncle had a brewery in Hungary. Oh, so a lot of, a lot, like of a lot of puzzle pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Budapest. I imagine Russia. I imagine it was much cheaper in in Hungary, but relative to Norway too. That as well. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, especially like labor force, I would say it's right. a lot cheaper. Yeah. yeah, like brewing equipment. If you want like high quality brewing equipment, you probably order it from Germany anyways. And then it's right. probably the same price. But uh, right, yeah. right. That's a fair point. Um, yeah. So you, you, you touched on this a little bit, but um, did, did you always, did, so you spent a lot of time with other formats before stumbling into MTTs. Did you always know kind of that you were a tournament player or... Um, is that just like the latest incarnation of your skills? Uh, no, I, I, for a long time, I just played cash games because it was very convenient with time schedule and stuff. I was going to university right. and like sitting up and playing tournaments all night wasn't really yeah. a viable option if you're going up to attend classes. Um, I did that for like one year where I only played Sundays and then every Monday morning I was totally wrecked going to school, of course. But mm -hmm. um, it just made more sense to play cash to have like a bit more of a free schedule. Uh, but I do enjoy tournaments a lot more, I would say, at least now. Um, and now I don't have anyone relying on me. I'm not, yeah, I'm a single man. Yeah. And I don't have a school or work or whatever. So I can just sit up all night and then sleep during the day like a vampire. So it works out. We, um, I've asked this question to a handful of the other people that have done this before, but um, I'm interested to hear your answer. Um, do you think that there's something about MTTs that and and your personality that make you more successful when you combine those two things, or do you think, um, do you think if you spent the exact same amount of time studying PLO, uh, no limit cash, whatever, any other variant, that you would have the exact same success? Do you think there's no correlation between your personality and MTTs? No, honestly, I don't think I don't think so. I think I could just uh, play any format really. Um, I, I'm very like patient, calm. I don't tilt. I don't have any like mental game issues or anything like that. So maybe that helps for playing tournaments. You know, like um, if you if you tend to go on tilt and you play cash games, you can just quit the session right and call it a day. Like you don't uh, spew off 10, uh, 10 stacks right. because you're tilted or whatever. But if you play tournaments, you can't really end your session when you want to. You end your session when you're done. So maybe I have a benefit yeah. for tournaments in that sense that I don't get emotional when I'm playing and I'm just evenly killed throughout the, yeah. So I remember maybe, when I was talking yeah. to Phil, when I was talking to Phil about it, he said that he, he seemed to think that PLO uh, fit more with his personality compared to like no limit hold'em or, or tournaments. And he thinks that if he spent the same amount of time playing no limit cash that he wouldn't have been as successful as if he as he was if he de dedicated that same amount of time to PLO. He's just I, I don't know. We couldn't really pinpoint the exact reason. Maybe it was some combination of creativity and I don't know. Um, he he seemed to think that no limit holdem required more precision, and I think he is uh, less precise uh, relative mm -hmm. to his opponents. So that that was kind of his his thought behind it. Okay. Um, so actually you brought up, uh, video games and your story was very, very similar to my own. So, uh, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, you, you mentioned Warcraft three, I, you know, I, I did a little bit of Warcraft three, but I started with probably command and conquer and then, um, some of those other, those other games, but Starcraft was my, was my primary game. Did you, did you uh, dabble much in that? No, not really. Um, I played a lot of stuff in the Blizzard universe. Um, yeah. Like I played Warcraft, World of Warcraft, Dota, Dota 2. Um, yeah. A lot of like tower defense and shit like that when we were yeah. like early. But I never played Starcraft really. I, I played it, but that was uh, never any good. Never played it really. Um, so yeah. 
played some Counter Strike. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're so. uh, you're causing flashbacks for me that I <laughs> I'm, having, I'm remembering fondly my time with those games. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. so. I, I have my own theories that I'll share on the answer to this question after this, but I want to hear what you have, to, what you think about this. Um, what is it about uh, Scandinavians in particular that that make that they seem to have a predisposition to success at poker? Um, do you have any reasons for that? Do you think so? <laughs> I'm I think not sure I agree with you, this. You don't think so? I think by percentage. There's there's uh, more successful Scan Scandinavian poker players uh, on on the whole than there are mm. with al almost any other population. Really? Huh. Um, I guess we're. I, I'm not sure if this is a positive or a negative though, but I, I feel like most Scandinavians they come from like a safe environment, you know, very safe environment where like, yeah very soft people, soft people from safe environment, you know? And I always thought that was like maybe a detriment rather than a positive thing, because um, if you're from a country where the average salary is really low and you're not that well off doing like any job, then you're more incentivized to crush poker, right? You're more incentivized to give it your all. Well, if you're from Norway, like if poker doesn't work out and I have to get like a regular nine to five job or whatever, I'm totally fine, you know, like people in Norway, the thing in Norway, especially, is that the gap between salaries are so low. I, I, I don't understand why we have so many master's degrees in Norway, because it makes no sense. Because if you work as a cleaner or you work at the grocery store or 7-Eleven or whatever, you still earn like very decent money, I would say. So it doesn't really make sense to get a higher high like degree. It's more like a status thing in Norway, I think. Um, but, but yeah, like I would assume that's like a detriment. Of course, it gives you the safety, so you're not like stressed about uh, like what if poker doesn't work out or whatever, because you feel pretty safe anyways. So maybe that's a good thing. Uh, maybe it allows you to take more risks and uh, not be as careful as you would have to be if you're from a situation where uh, if poker doesn't work out now, you have like a really struggle to get uh, get things going again or whatever, right? Yeah. So you uh, essentially said word for word exactly uh, my theory on why, uh, why, why they're more successful. I, I was actually going to say exactly what you just said, that um, they, have a better <laughs> they have a better safety net. I, re I remember talking to Lars Luzak yeah. some time ago, and he was like, you know, um, there, there's no consequences, essentially, if he goes broke. He, can, yeah. he said, I would, I would just be totally fine just being a teacher or something like that. He, he's yeah, like, yeah. you know, not a problem. It's not a big deal if you go broke. So that's why I think they they have a a fearlessness to them. Like, you know, Zygmunt, Patrick, uh, some of the old school uh, Scandinavians Isildur. are just, Isildur are just cutthroat. They, can, they just <laughs> don't care. It's just easy come, easy go. Million up, million down, doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's um, Oh, my other theory is that it's dark um, so much. So a lot of inside time and uh, you can you can spend a lot of time on the computer, um, mm -hmm. you know, when, when the sun's down. That makes um, sense. Okay, so I, I want to give you a little bit of an opportunity to talk about Overbet Express, like what it is, uh, why you decided to pursue it and, you know, plans for the future with Overbet Express, um, just because I know that's like a pretty big uh, thing. That you have going on so give yeah us, give it, us it, the overview yeah yeah so it's not a big thing yet but we're hoping to um put a lot of effort into it and hope that people like what we're doing um so we'll get some attention going and build like a strong community i think that's the main goal uh we're gonna produce content mostly for poker but some for sports betting maybe crypto we're, we're not really sure because there's you know in crypto there are so many like smart content creators in crypto and crypto is not our main thing uh, we all like yeah. dabbling crypto and it's cool and we're all very interested but like we're not uh, professional traders we're not uh, super 200 iq when it comes to all the new projects and stuff so we're, we're a bit on the fence if we should do crypto or if we should just focus on poker and sports betting which is our main uh which is our core thing right and where we have um a lot of expertise like uh, the people in my team, like we've been playing poker for a 
combined, I don't know, like uh, 40 years or whatever, right? 40, 50 years. Uh, one of them has been a professional sports better for a lot of years and really crushed that. So in poker and sports betting, we have like a lot of expertise. So maybe we're just going to focus on those two areas. It's not really decided. Uh, but we have a, a Twitch stream where we're streaming mostly poker. Then we have a YouTube channel where we post um, some IRL stuff behind the scenes, whatever. Highlight videos from Twitch. Um, yeah, some educational content as well. We're making like a small video series about uh, basically how to make it in poker. Um, so, we're, so we're doing some different things, trying stuff out. Uh, it's still pretty fresh and we're just learning as we go basically uh, our video we have like a videographer editor guy on team who's like super um super good with this stuff and understands the meme culture understands the internet culture really uh he's like the strategy guy i, I don't understand shit so i just do what he tells me to do um yeah yeah well that's a that's probably the best if you if you take directions good and you have somebody that's good at it then then that's going to be yeah, your yeah. best bet um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, so is, is this your sports guy that you referenced? Is that Jonas? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Great. I thought so. You know um, him, right? Yeah. 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 Um, he's he friends was also with, like, coach old... for run it once, right? No, uh, wait. he was no. coach for some, no, he was coach for some other site, like back in the days. It was yeah, he's, was he's buddies with like, uh, Leo and Ola. So that's yeah, how, yeah, yeah. that's how we got introduced to each other initially. Um, okay, okay. So, get, what is the deal with with your sports betting? What areas do you focus on? Is it all sports, or are you just soccer, or something like that? Um, I think it's going to be all sports. I think it's. Uh, I, I know he focuses. I don't want to say something and then it's not right, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Uh, first of all, it's more like an overarching theme of like he's going to explain how the sports betting industry works. Because uh, there's a lot of stuff that a lot of people have a relationship with sports betting, but they don't really understand how it works. And they don't really, like most people are just fish, right? Like if me, right. if I did any yeah. sports betting, I'm For like sure. a massive fish. I have no idea what's yeah. going on. Um, well, like 99.9% .9 of people are losers. Exactly. Yeah, it's probably even worse than in poker, right? Uh, yeah, I would say for sure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think he's going to do like some educational content on sports betting as a whole, like how the whole in industry works and um, how you need to approach it if you want to do it profitably and try to educate people a bit. Um, but when it comes to what specific sports he's going to focus on, uh, I can't really tell you. Yeah, actually, just thinking about it right now, I think the, you know, in sports betting, it's it's possible to have 100% losers, whereas in poker, that's, I mean, yeah, theoretically, it's possible to have 100% losers, but in, but yeah. more often than not, you're going to have at least some portion of the population as winners in poker relative to sports betting. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sports yes, betting you, is tough. If you have to rake enough, but if you have to yeah. rake enough in poker, you can have 100% losers. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's what, that's what I, <laughs> I guess <laughs> theoretically you could, but, but I mean, that would yeah. be a really tough game if, uh, if you have 100% losers. All right, so we're, I want to get give you some poker questions because I feel like uh, um, we would be doing a disservice if we didn't do some uh, <laughs> some poker questions. Um, cool. This is a question that, you know, I've asked other people, but uh, I, I do want to get your thoughts on it. Um, what do you think is the biggest hindrance um, for people? Um, I guess we can talk specifically MTTs here. Um, if they are going from, let's say, $25 uh, average buy-in to $100 average buy-in. And then um, same question, but go from 100, 100 to 500. And then same question, but go 500 to, you know, big, big time tournaments. The first one is pretty hard for me to answer because uh, I don't want to sound like an asshole, but I never played tournaments below $100 pretty much because I came from cash game background. So right, whenever right. I started playing tournaments, I already had a OK bankroll. And I felt like at that point, I felt like every tournament player is a fish anyways. So cash game players know how to play poker. Tournament players don't was my mindset yeah. like a lot of years ago. But now like yep. now that I'm a tournament player, I can see that my mindset was just, yeah, I was just coming from a, but it used well, to be sure like that, that, that back was in the, the days. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say that was everybody's thought um, a while, uh, you know, at least a decade ago. That was definitely the thought. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but now, like a lot of the tournament stuff, like and now I think actually the best tournament players are probably more advanced than the ter- best cash game players, just because cash games, like how how hard is it to learn six max uh, cash games these days? Like you have all these solver solutions and like you can just grind the solvers really hard and it's always, let's say that you play 100 big blind cash game, no ante. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a certain stake level, so the same rake structure or whatever, you can just grind those sims day in and day out, and you're going to learn it very, very well, right? In tournaments, yep. suddenly you have ICM in the picture, you have mixed stacks, you have so much stuff going on, bounties sometimes. Uh, yep. There's just so yep. much stuff going on, and like some of those spots are infinitely complex. When it comes to like ICM, people are still very clueless, and when it comes to multi-way pots, people are still pretty clueless, I would say. So yep. there's still like, we're still like so far away from being good at tournaments. Um, while in cash games, I think the best players, they've pretty much figured it out. Um, so I think tournaments is way more complex actually. And, um, but yeah, uh, to answer your question, like the biggest mistakes people make from 25 to 100. Uh, we could say 100, 100 to 500 and then maybe like 500 to, you know, to taking the big jump to, you know, the highest W coops, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think like the main thing that separates the lower, low mid stakes from the high, uh, high stakes players is probably just aggression, right? Uh, like very rarely, if you play the bounty builder 109, you're gonna face someone who uh, bets 25% flop, uh, 2x pot turn, and 5x pot jams river, right? You just you just yeah. don't see it at lower stakes. Well, if you play against uh, some of the big boys uh, like Mikita or Adam or whatever, you, you're always ready. Like you need to protect your range. You need to not cap yourself because you know uh, at any point they could give you like a two x pot turn and five x pot river, and then right. just, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the main point. Um, I think like also when it comes to ICM, there's a big gap in skill level. Um, I think like most people by now, most people who are trying, most people who are trying to be good at poker, they know how to play button versus big blind at 30 bigs, uh, like heads up, single race, you know, GPV spots. But when it comes to ICM, there is still like, I see like regs who are doing some insane stuff when it comes to ICM still. So I think, um, I think that's where we're going to see the biggest difference between the stake levels because at high stakes, people are uh, putting more effort into ICM, I think, because they've already learned all the chip EV stuff and they've kind of gone past that and now they're, yeah. Yeah, so in that sense, do you think um, that the skill level between, you know, some of the, some of the big boys that we mentioned and then um, what I would call like a successful, you know, $300 average buy-in person are relatively close at the beginning of a tournament and then uh, that skill starts to expand massively once you once you reach the money bubble um area that's when the the best of the best tend to um exert their their ability yeah yeah that makes sense that's that's one thing and also like you know in tournaments um there's like this meta skill of how to win a tournament because you can sit in pio all day and learn how to play uh whatever spot right but actually trying to play the tournament in a way where you have a lot of chips approaching the bubble, having a lot of chips approaching the final table, being like one of the chip leaders on a final table, there's so much added value in that, right? And I think a lot of um, right. like lower to mid stakes guys, uh, they don't value enough the act of just being, because you, so, you see so many people in tournaments that are just overly aggressive in every node and you're like, how can these people win so much? Like they're, they're just clicking bet and race every time they don't have a check button and still they seem right. to win everything, right? And it is just because like having a big stack going into the late stages of a tournament, you can just do so much damage, right? Um, especially if people don't press call enough versus you, which is yep. the case in smaller binds, right? And lower mid stakes, people don't press call enough because they're not used to getting bluffed into enough. So if you are hyper aggressive, you're just gonna crush those field, fields. and like understanding like how to build that stack in going into the final table and whatever is um, 
it's like a meta skill or whatever you want to call it meta skill where yep. yeah no i like it um so my colleague andy writes um and this is the subject of your first video and presumably uh, a handful of your uh, future videos. You made a deep run in the most recent online WSOP main event. Can you give us some insights about that experience and how did it feel to stream um, that event? It was a very cool experience, to be honest. It was very, very cool. Um, so the way it was done was that when you made the final table, you had a week before, I think it was a week before the final table was um so i had like one week to just grind my ass off in icm sims and uh yeah prepare myself mentally had like a couple of sessions with like a mental game coach did a bunch of uh exercise ate healthy slept well did like everything i could for that week to prepare and it was a very cool experience um a lot of people mentioned like uh uh, why would you stream that? Why would you expose yourself like that? First of all, from like a strategic point of view, but second yeah. of all, like from an emotional point of view, like you're playing, like my biggest final table before this uh, was like 200K up top. I had like a few final tables with 200K up top and this was two and a half million up top. So 12 and a half times as big as my previous final table, right? And no matter how well prepared you are and like how relaxed you are, how many hours you meditate for the week before, you're going to have some like emotional um, connection to that final table and the result. And it's impossible to walk away from it, like, except if you win it. You're, it. That's how tournaments work in general, right? You, you, you're never like 100% happy unless you win the thing, right? And especially for a final right. table like this, uh, a lot of people were asking like, why do you want to stream this? Like it just adds like extra extra layer of uh, stress and emotional whatever you know on top and you're exposing yourself by talking openly about the strategy you're using and whatever um which <laughs> was probably fair but at that point i had streamed like the whole turn up until then and, yeah yeah uh, and we're, we were in the beginning phases of building this over bed express and i was just like imagine the hype if i win this shit live on stream and i've streamed the whole right. thing is it, it's just like yeah, it you, would be insane. Uh, you, you owed it to everybody after you streamed the, uh, that part. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, also, I, I kind of feel like, um, like you were saying, the up top in your previous tournaments was 200K. I, I don't think, I don't know, at least for me, if you 12X the buy-in or you 100X the buy-in, you, you, you reach a plateau of, of what you can feel. It's not, you can't feel, you can't feel 100x uh, the anxiety. I mean, your heart would explode if that was the case. <laughs> so, so yeah. you know, let, let's say you were playing for 200,000. That's enough to get your uh, to get your juices flowing, presumably, or it should be. And then, yep. if you if you increase it to a million, you you know maybe you go from 90% uh, to 91%. And then if you increase it to, to 12 million then you could maybe you go to 97 percent. so the, the yeah, gap no. kind of goes there's a lot less. of uh, a lot of diminishing returns in terms of exci exactly. anxiety yeah, there for yeah. sure but yeah um, but, but it was a different experience for sure i think especially because you had like a week to build it up and uh it was the wsop main event so there's like right. some extra prestige not for me personally like i i don't care too much about trophies and titles and stuff but i know that a lot of people do, <laughs> uh, especially like yeah, amongst like the not uh, top elite players, like the mainstream population and the people who play like maybe recreationally or like semi-professionally or whatever, yeah. for them, like these titles is a big deal, right? For a lot of them. Um, do you so, yeah. think that being on the stream impacted your play or no? I don't, I, honestly, I, I think zero percent, but yeah. you can never say, like, you can never yeah, really yeah. say that, like, I don't think so. Uh, like, looking back, there's no hands I would have played that I would have wanted to play differently, you know, I just, I think I just executed the strategy that I was to the best of my ability and that was it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. I, I, I kind of would get that sense, um, especially from what you were saying earlier that you, you aren't re a really big tilt, tilt guy, so. Um, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't imagine that it would impact you that much. Um, yeah. You so you, you mentioned this already, but but just to go back to it, um, if you weren't involved in poker, what would you be doing? 
I don't know that like probably the brewing thing I had like yeah. a lot of passion for craft beer and brewing and stuff and I was going pretty heavily into that but uh I, I've kind of lost the drive for that now I'm also very like focused on health and fitness uh, for the last few years and I don't really drink that much alcohol anymore so the whole beer thing kind of like it's not a big part of my life anymore but I guess like so people ask me now, like, what would I do if I had like infinite money? If I didn't have to yeah. uh, make any money ever again, I'm like mm -hmm. uh, very, very safely retired. Uh, and I say that probably I would go to uh, my university town in Norway and create like a retro gaming brew pub kind of thing mm -hmm. where you have like uh, old Nintendo consoles uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Super Nintendo and whatever uh, amazing craft beer on tap and uh, like shuffleboard and games you know like i love games every game is just yeah so probably yeah. create a concept like that would be really fun um yeah i don't know I, I i i think that's still in the cards uh in in your life so like you said pe you know people are not going to stop drinking beer so <laughs> that yeah, <yeah>. opportunity <laughs> is not going to go away for sure um yeah. okay back to back to poker where do you, where do you see uh, for the future of poker? Because um, at least from my perspective, uh, everybody's been worried for a while about solvers, RTA, you know, all, all that stuff, um, yeah. basically causing causing the downfall of poker. And um, but but that doesn't seem to be the case. You know, I, there's tournaments and setting records and higher and higher guarantees all the time. Um, so what, how do you kind of see poker progressing over the next few years and then maybe even say 10 15 years down the road Look, i'm such a bad person to ask about this because i'm like so naive and i don't care too much like for me i just want to play the best poker that i can and i'm not really worried about rta and stuff but that's just me mm -hmm. being super naive there is probably like there is issues and there has been cases of course and people get banned and there are allegations allegations or whatever and stuff happens but for me i just try to focus on my game and try to be the best that I can. And if at some point online isn't really uh, all that profitable anymore because RTA or whatever, you know, then live poker will always be amazing. There is, I have no doubt that live poker will always be like a big thing, you know? Um, yeah. So then just do that, I guess. But, yep. but, but I don't know. Like, I, I still think online poker has a lot of years before it's um, at that point where it's like. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, how, how much time do you spend with solvers nowadays? Is that uh, an integral part of your routine or, or um, less so? Yeah. No, it is like the main uh, way that I study poker now, I would say. Um, I usually just every session that I play, I mark every hand that I'm not sure about. And then I go through them mm -hmm. in some solvers, um, maybe discuss them with friends sometimes, do like hand history reviews or whatever. But um, but always during those reviews as well, we're using solvers. So I, I would say it's like the the best way to get really good right now. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think you can do different things and there's like different uh, intensity levels to your ways of studying. Like for me, I'm like the lowest effort, like the most chill is just like to work on Twitch stream and uh, me post memes in the chat or whatever. And like maybe yeah. you learn some stuff, you know, if the guy you're watching is good at poker, you learn some stuff. Um, so I'll do that sometimes and I'll watch uh, training videos as well. I think uh, that's also like pretty low effort depending on how you do it. I know some people are super serious when they watch uh, training videos. They like sit there and take notes. They go back to like really understand it. They watch the video two times or whatever. Like some people are super serious about training videos. For me, that's uh, more like a relaxed thing as well. I watch the training video and I try to like uh, conceptualize and I try to listen yeah. to what they're saying. I'm not like, I'm not like big note taker and like super serious on that. Uh, but when I'm doing... Um, solver work and i'm doing running sims and stuff then i'm pretty serious about it and i do take notes and i do uh, spend a lot of time going back and forth and testing sizings and testing theories and yeah changing one suit or changing one card or like yeah then i'm pretty yeah, serious I, I i agree with that approach not everything has to be like super cutthroat uh you know 100 effort max effort studying sometimes it's passive sometimes it's uh 
little more aggressive in terms of how you approach it. That's that's a good good way to think about it. You don't have to be hundred percent dialed in every second, every time. That's that's unrealistic. Um, yeah. okay, so we had a follow up question. Somebody wrote, "What what are some limitations of solvers? And is there anything that you think is beneficial to learning uh, that is better or more valuable than spending that same amount of time studying solver outputs?" Uh, for the first part, uh, what was the limitations of solvers? I think the main limitation is not in the solver itself, but in the people who use them, because people tend to, it's really easy to fuck up a solver sim. Like if you give it the wrong inputs, like you give bad sizings or uh, you give uh, your opponent the option to check raise only like a large sizing, suddenly your, your strat is going to change a lot because he's not playing, mm -hmm. you know, it's like very complex to build a good sim. Um, and it takes a lot of practice and it takes a lot of effort actually building the sim correctly. So I think yeah. that's like, um, and, and then, you know, when you get to, you actually have a good sim in place, um, you, it, it's very hard to know how to use it as well. Like on the flop, of course, like, okay, everything is good, but then you get to the turn and if he, if your opponent plays a different strat than the sim does on the flop, now your turn strat is going to look very different and you can do node lo locking and stuff, but it's, it's really hard to like actually get good inputs from sims. So I think like uh, trying to like memorize solutions and stuff like that is not really uh, the best way to use these sims and not the best use of your time, but rather trying to like conceptualize why the solver wants to do what it does in certain spots, like try to uh, learn concepts instead of solutions. Try to understand like, okay, what is it about this uh, texture or this spot that makes the solver want to do this? You know, like trying to do that because if you run enough simulations, like if you, if you run through enough spots and you try to think like this always, uh, you're going to find patterns, right? Uh, where yeah. pattern seeking always. And like, if you, if you run enough of these spots, you're going to pick up on patterns and st stuff is going to start clicking. And once stuff starts clicking, it's just, you keep building on that and uh, you become more and more like theoretically solid, right? So. Yeah, for sure. Phil talks about that when, when he uh, uses vision, that it's less important to know exactly what to do in a, sp in a given situation, but more important to pick up the pattern that you uh, seemingly, you know, let's say you consistently get ace high boards wrong, you know, then then that's that's the pattern you need to start evaluating that rather than oh ace nine three I got this wrong, and diving yeah, into yeah, that yeah. specific thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, back l less poker. Too much too much poker so far. Um, um, <laughs> Oh, actually, we it's have the only a, thing I know. We, Keep asking poker questions. I know, it's the only thing I know. I know anything about. Okay. Well, we have one submitted from a user. Terry Yan says, "What's the toughest spot you've ever been put in while playing poker?" <laughs> it's got to be like an ICM spot for a lot of money. That's that's kind of what I would guess. Yeah. Or like a, a five way five way to the flop or something like that dude i i can't tell you <laughs> that's a pretty okay. hard question <laughs> uh, um, he yeah. says he's been put in a tough spot by you before that i guess that's why he answered that's why okay. he asked the question that's good that's good to um, hear. yeah i guess that that's a that's a, a compliment in poker uh, cool um <laughs> okay so give us your well, I want to ask you a little bit about Thailand. What, where exactly in Thailand do you live? And my uh, my colleague asked, can you actually get tired of Thai food, or is that just not not uh, able to happen? What are your general experiences with Thailand so far? Uh, we're in Phuket. We're in the very southern southern part of Phuket. It's very like. Um backpacker vibe down here like everyone is here like most people here that i talk to uh like europeans or americans or whatever they came here for two months and that was in 2014 you know like <laughs> <laughs> it is just like a very easy place to get stuck and because the lifestyle here is very relaxed it's very nice it's very i'm loving it a lot actually and i was planning to only be here for two months but it's so nice here that i kind of don't want to leave now I have finally booked my flight tickets back to Europe. So I'm only staying for three more weeks here. 
Um, but that's mostly just because I need to get back grinding. And grinding here is, if you want to play tournaments, it's then not low time zone. Like if I want to play like prime time schedule here, I would have to start grinding at midnight and play to like eight in the morning or whatever. Yeah. And it's just, yep. and what's the point of living here? You know, then you can just, no. Um, um, go ahead, keep going. Yeah, no, but yeah, in general, I would say it's very high life quality here. Um, Thai food is probably my second favorite cuisine over Mexican food, I would say. Thai and Mexican are like really close up there. And here they have like amazing restaurants for both. I think I've eaten almost just as much Mexican since I came here, which is a shame to say that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's like a little, yeah. We're, we're eating every meal out basically, and we're grinding Thai and Mexican every day. So at this point I'm starting to get close to it's going to be nice to have a break from curries and stuff, actually, when I leave yeah. this place now. It's going to be nice. Yeah. 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 Um, it's probably a little bit exciting to get back to, to where you're from. Um, at least that would be my experience. Um, yeah. Let me see. I want to get also, a few it's more like, questions. I, I kind of miss like the safety from Europe, you know? Like, you, it's a very different culture here. It's a very different vibe. It's a very different climate. It's very different. Uh, what do you mean? What uh, do you mean by that? Like I, I woke up uh, in the middle of the night a few weeks ago in our previous villa. I'm going to the bathroom. Uh, I turn on the light and I, I'm glad I did because I almost stepped on a scorpion in my bathroom. Oof. And that's just like something in Europe, you yeah. never have a fucking scorpion in your bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, yeah, that's uh, fair. That's a fair there's point. Like, there's like a bunch of uh, insects, like snakes and... Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a bunch of stuff here that like I'm not really a big fan of. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, you you might turn the light on at home and get a polar bear. <laughs> that that would be your biggest risk. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, a few more poker, then I'm then I'm going to jump into uh, something else. Um, give us your worst day in poker and your best day in poker. Um, worst day in poker. Fuck, I should have prepared for these questions. Like, I... Uh, you could, we could skip that one. I don't, I don't even like it, to be honest. I'm going to ask you a different one. <laughs> Where would you rate yourself in terms of talent versus hard worker over the course of your career? And did this, did this shift? So, obviously, you have, you know, some guys that are just naturally gifted that don't spend any time uh, studying the game. They're just that good. And then other people that, you know probably aren't very good, but just nonstop hard work. Um, where, do, where, which end of the spectrum do you fall? Um, probably more on the talented side than hardworking side, I would think. Like, I think my big advantage going into poker was that I was playing so much video games, you know? Like, I, like in my teens, I didn't leave the house much. I was just playing video games. And uh, I think a lot of those skills can translate to poker like uh, sure. Warcraft 3 or Starcraft or whatever it is, you know, like micromanaging all these units and like remembering to keep producing units while you're fighting. And like, yeah. you're, you're constantly like, um, and playing a bunch of poker tournaments at the same time is not that different, I would say. Um, so I think I had like a big advantage going into it. And also like, you can ask me, like you threatened to ask, like before this call started, you threatened to ask like about Norwegian history and shit like that. Uh, and when it comes to stuff like that, I'm one of the stupidest people I know. Uh, we'll find but out. In school, fuck no. <laughs> but, but when it comes to um, in school, I did really well in like uh, science, like chemistry, statistics, uh, mm -hmm. uh, math, everything that was like logical and stuff like that. I did uh, well. Um, but everything that you had like memorized, like countries or... Uh, literature or whatever i was yeah, just dog yeah. shit you know so um, yeah i think i'm uh, my my brain is pretty well suited for poker and logical games i think yep i like it um so obviously you're norwegian you're in thailand have you done much traveling uh aside from that or is uh is this your your primary traveling experience uh no i've been traveling a lot since as I said, like I've been playing poker since 2004. So every year I was going on at least one poker trip, most years, mm -hmm. multiple poker trips, uh, as well as like just 
trips with university mates or whatever. We would go to uh, all the European cities, like the big party cities or whatever, like Amsterdam and Prague, uh, Riga, whatever. We would travel a lot within Europe, but I haven't traveled that much outside of Europe. I've been to the US. I did like a six weeks road trip in the US and spent some time uh, on both coasts, like sometime in New York and sometimes uh, on the West Coast. Um, but this is my first trip to Asia, actually, which is kind of crazy given that I'm 33 years old now and this is my first trip to Asia. It's, uh, yeah. What, uh, give us your top three destinations. Um, I, I really enjoyed my time in the US. I don't know why, but it's like a lot of, especially Seattle, I think. Seattle, I really enjoyed. Uh, but I think it was more because of the experiences and like the people that I met. When I went to Seattle, I was, um, I had like a week in between because I was with my university friends in New York. Then I had like a week in between be before I was meeting another friend who I was doing the road trip with. So I had like a week alone in Seattle and the people that I met there and like people were so uh, welcoming and like took me home to their homes for dinner and people were like super friendly, you know, and I was like, I, I yeah. remember feeling after that week a sense of like gratitude and happiness that was just it kind of like uh, gets me emotional now just thinking about it how happy I was because I met so many ma amazing people uh, so I'd say probably uh, US and specifically Seattle was really nice um, in Europe I really like Barcelona a lot which I think it's kind of controversial. I, I know a lot of people hate Barcelona because it's like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. But I, I really like Barcelona just because it has everything for me. It has like the beach, it has mountains. I really like going hiking and stuff like that. It has like cool streets and yeah, it's a big you, city, but you also have nature. So I like Barcelona a lot. Do you uh, make a habit of traveling um, outside of, I guess when you were younger, did you make a habit of traveling outside of Norway when it was winter season? Is that a common occurrence for many Norwegians or do you spend the winter in Norway? Mostly spend, um, I spent my winters in Norway. Uh, most of the trips we did to uh, warmer destinations was during the summer, I would say, during like summer breaks and whatever, we'd go to mm -hmm. Spain or whatever. But um, yeah, mostly just spent winter, winters in Norway, uh, which doesn't make any sense because I'm shit at every winter sport, but uh, good at video games, I guess. So, <laughs> so yeah, I guess winter. that works. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Well, maybe you know about uh, winter sports. So we're, I'm going to get into the next section. Uh, so I, I, when when I first found out that Espen was going to join us for this call, I I, uh, I reached out to my good Norwegian buddies Andres and and Adots and former Run It Once coach. Um, and we wanted to come up with uh, a handful of questions for, for Espen, you know, Norway related, um, see if we could stump him here. So uh, um, it's going to be an embarrassment. Let's go. So, so it's a mix. It's a little bit poker, a little bit, a little bit history, that kind of thing. So I, I don't know. I think it's like 10 or 11 questions. We're just going to, we're just going to rip through them, see how you do. All right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, first question, who has the most uh, Norwegian WSOP bracelets? Uh... <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a clue. He has he has two. I would be surprised if Tor Hansen doesn't. It's Tor Hansen, right? Yep, you got it. Cool. One for one. Okay. Okay. Um, Ola wanted you to name three other Norwegians that have won a bracelet, but I'll just I'll I'll take two. One one should be easy. Is it him? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's a that's a good uh, guess though, I guess. I'll give yeah, you I'll give you a clue um, for one. It's uh, a female. Annette Oberstad or she yeah. won WSAP Europe main, right? Yeah. I guess yeah, that I'm gets a bracelet. Yeah, yeah. Um and then I had never heard of any of the others, but uh if you don't get it in five uh, seconds, I'll just give it, I'll give you a handful of them. Yeah, just give me, give me a few and I'll be okay. like, oh, fuck, right, yeah. Sigurd Eskeland. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. That one makes sense. Uh, Espen Senj Sandvik. Yeah, yeah. I actually spoke to him uh, on Messenger yesterday. <laughs> uh, try give lead. <laughs> what? T R Y G V. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He won like uh, some GG events, I think, online yeah. uh, WSP thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Alex Kobaltoot. Oh, yeah. Kobaltoot. I know him as well. Co okay, yeah. that's all I got. Okay. My, cool. my, my accent probably sounds perfect. Um, yeah, Sigurd Eskeland was the one I would probably have been able to come up with. Um, but I, I think I knew all of them if you had given me like a day to think, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, what year was the Winter Olympics in Oslo and Lillehammer? Lillehammer was 1994. Yes. Oslo, I have no fucking idea. It's probably like way before Give I was born. Guess. It was before you were born, for sure. 78. 52. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, what Norwegian gold medalist in giant slalom from 1952 moved to U.S. to become a celebrity ski instructor to Bruce Springsteen, Barbara Streisand, and Chelsea Clinton? Yeah. Ass. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I wouldn't be able to guess it, ever. His name is Stein Erikson. Never heard of Doesn't it. Ring uh, a bell. Fair enough. Doesn't ring a bell. Um, what three Norwegian? What Norwegian won three individual golds in Lillehammer in 1994? <laughs> no idea. Johan dude, Olaf Kos. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, like a skater, dude. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, ice skates. Uh, um, we should, you know, we should have brought um, Jonas in for this because a handful of them are sports. He, he would crush it. He would almost yeah, crush it. Who is the best female golfer in Norway? The best female golfer? Yeah. Oh. I, I'm not going to get it, so I'm just going to let you tell me. But this one, I actually feel I should know. Suzanne Peterson. Peter, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Peter, yeah, yeah, Peterson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's how embarrassing many, not knowing that because that you should know. Oh. Yeah. How many PGA Tour victories does Victor Hovland have? What's with all the golf questions? I played golf one time. Wait, what's that with? I think, I think Aldo Olsen was with us that time actually. Or I'm I know he plays a ton. Him and, and Leo just play all day. So yeah, I, I played like a uh, driving range a few times, and then I played on a proper course once. I think. <laughs> um, how many PGA Tour titles does yeah. some dude have? Um, seven. Three. Cool. Okay, two two thousand Olympics female soccer finals USA versus Norway. What was the final score? This should have been a bit. You you were probably in high school watching it. I was probably playing World of Warcraft to be honest. But, yeah, uh, yeah, fair point. Uh, three one. Very close. Three two. Norway wins. Okay. What is the <laughs> largest island of Svalbard? Uh, Jan Mayan. No, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, let me have No? Spitsbergen. Uh, God damn it. I've even been there. My, co my cousin lives there. <laughs> they actually have polar bears. Like, you're yeah, not I allowed know. to leave, like, the main city area without a gun because they actually have polar bears, like, yeah, roaming, roaming around, around and shit. Yeah. Um, okay. AHA <laughs> is most known for Take On Me. What was the name of the album? uh pass hunting high and low all right the, these, are from, never, these are from olaf specifically what percentage of, of the surface of norway is suited for agriculture <laughs> uh 90 oh man you went the wrong way it's four percent Suited for agriculture. What is that supposed to mean? Yeah, like you can you, grow something. You can grow it. shit. Yeah. What do you mean four percent? It's mostly it, forest, right? Norway is fucking a big forest with some houses in between. What do you mean? This is from all. All right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note of that one, and I'm gonna reach back out to Ola. I'm gonna say you you had uh, <laughs> issues with that one. All right. So, uh, which city is nicknamed the Paris of the North? 
Trumsa? Yeah, you got it. All right, Five final more. one. If one does not buy tobacco, what is the maximum number of bottles of wine you can bring in on their quota when entering Norway? Six? Yeah. <laughs> got that one. Right, that's that one good. Good. <laughs> I, I actually probably expected that you to get that one the least. But. No, because I, I'm building like a wine cellar in my home in Norway. Mm. Uh, so every time so I come exactly to Norway, that. I... I try to max out the quota with like uh, some nicer wines and stuff that I just chuck yeah. in the basement. And then uh, one day maybe I'll drink some of them, you know? Yeah, no, that was good. I liked it. You no, finished no. fair enough. Plus you took umbrage with one of the questions. So I will, I will, um, I will give you a pass on that one. And I felt like you knew <laughs> some of the other ones you just um, in, in our time frame. That and I, work, it's so. very late here in Thailand, you know, my brain is done for the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F- another fair point. So um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say, um, you know, a uh, solid B, B minus. Cool, I'll take it. Okay, um, so I want to uh, thank everyone uh, that joined us today. Um, if you missed any, uh, any part of this, we're going to post it on the site, usually a day or two um, after this. Um, so you'll see it on the top bar under monthly calls. I want to thank uh, my colleague Andy for helping get this set up. And obviously, thanks to our newest coach, Espen, for joining us all all the way from Thailand. So thank you. Thank everyone very much. Um, Make sure to check out Espen's uh, videos on Run It Once. We are making some technical adjustments to the the video, and we're going to have it back on the site uh, very shortly. Um, So thanks again. Thanks, Espen. Uh, That was fun. And chat soon. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys.